John 3.16 tends to be the first Bible verse many memorize as a child. In Sunday school, it's learned that it's essentially Christianity 101, a simple formula for faith, a handy evangelism tool, and a perfect summary of the good news. Over the years, the verse has been displayed on billboards, t-shirts, coffee mugs, and cross-stitch samplers. Martin Luther called it the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. And so it is. On this second Sunday of Lent, as we consider Jesus' lengthy nighttime encounter with Nicodemus, John 3.16 jumps out of their perplexing dialogue for its efficiency and pithiness. In just 27 words, the verse describes a loving God, a cherished world, a self-giving son, a universal invitation, a deliverance from death, and a promise of eternal life. Christianity in a nutshell, right? Well, maybe not. The problem is not in the verse itself, but in what the church so often does with it. In our well-intentioned efforts to make the gospel message accessible and palatable, we sometimes reduce salvation to a sound bite. Forgetting that when Jesus originally spoke the words to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, and likely one of the more erudite men of his day, his listener found Jesus' words incomprehensible. How can these things be? Nicodemus asked in astonishment. When Jesus spoke to him in the obscure and metaphorical language of birth, flesh, water, and spirit. But Jesus, unfazed by the Pharisees' confusion, refused to simplify his explanation. If he intended to save Nicodemus quickly and easily that night, he failed. What the seeker experienced was not salvation. It was bewilderment. If Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus is representative of God's preferred evangelism style, then I have to wonder, what does the more formulaic approach of Christianity leave out? Are we so invested in keeping the faith cozy and comfortable that we minimize its weirdness, its otherness, its offensiveness? Jesus had no problem leaving Nicodemus confused and muddled. He was in no hurry to get Nicodemus to sign on the dotted line. The spirit blows where it chooses, Jesus said. The spirit cannot be caged or contained which means the journey of faith and the workings of salvation can't be caged or contained either. When we speak of God's kingdom, we are in a realm of deep mystery. It's okay to be surprised. It's okay to be stricken. It's okay to take our time. After all, what Jesus was offering Nicodemus was not a tune-up or a few minor tweaks to an already near-perfect life. It was a brand new life. A new birth, a fresh, down-to-the-foundations beginning. What newborn enters the world without birth pangs, shock, disorientation, or pain? Downright bewilderment, bewilderment isn't the exception in a birth story. It's the rule. If we don't find Christianity at least a little bit confusing, then perhaps it's not Christianity we are practicing. As I sit with Nicodemus' baffled reaction to Jesus, here's what I'm asking myself. What does our glib reading of John 3.16 prevent us from seeing about God, Christ, faith, sin, and salvation? Do we lean too hard on the importance of individual belief and forget the stunning truth that God loves and longs for all creation, quite apart from our belief or unbelief? Do we treat Jesus' words as a litmus test, using it not to communicate God's all-encompassing compassion and mercy, but to threaten unbelievers with God's judgment? Do we allow our interpretation to flatten and distort the meaning of belief, reducing it to nuance and complexity to mere intellectual assent? What does it mean, after all, to say, I believe in Jesus? Why is belief? of all things, so important to God. All too often we are taught that being a Christian 
means affirming the right things. To accept Jesus into our heart to be born again, we was, was to agree to a set of doctrines about who Jesus is and what he accomplished through his death and resurrection. To enter into Orthodox faith was to believe that certain theological statements about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the human condition, the Bible, and the church were true. When we spoke of growing in the faith, what we meant was that there were honing our doctrinal commitments to be a mature Christian was to have one's theological ducks in a row. Unfortunately, I've watched congregations split up over the legitimacy of infant baptism over believers' baptism. I knew Christians who considered speaking in tongues as a litmus test for faith. I've heard pastors fight over whether the communion table should be open, available to all, or closed reserved for baptized members of a particular faith community. I've heard others argue over the most nitpicky details concerning the end times. Would God take his children to heaven before the great tribulation, or would they have to hang around and endure the birth pangs of a new kingdom? For the earnest and well-meaning people involved, none of these questions were silly or peripheral. They cut to the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Getting the theological particulars Right was paramount. What else could faith entail if not fidelity to the correct particulars? I fear that we fall into the same trap when we speak glibly of John 3.16 as Christianity in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. It sounds so gorgeously precise, so deceptively simple, but does all of Christianity really come down to us accepting certain propositions about Jesus to be factual, to be true? Is that really it? For me, this way of believing, this way of defining faith as an intellectual assent to precisely codified doctrines has fallen apart. Not because we can't assent, but because our assenting in and of itself hasn't fostered anything close to the meaningful relationship we desire to have with God. If anything, our intellectual assent has functioned as a smokescreen, a distraction, a substitute. In her 2013 book, Christianity After Religion, Diana Butler Bass points out that the English word believe comes from the German word, which I'm going to massacre, believe it? The German word for love. To believe is not to hold an opinion. To believe is to treasure, to hold something beloved, to give our hearts over to it without reservation. To believe in something is to invest in it with our love. This is true in the ancient languages of the Bible as well. When the writers of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament wrote of faithfulness, they were not writing about an intellectual surrender to a factual truth. They were writing about fidelity, trust, and confidence. As they saw it, to believe in God was to place their full confidence in him, to throw their whole hearts, minds, and bodies into their hands. The fact is, I can't think of any significant human relationships in which doctrine matters more than love and trust. So why should our relationship with God be any different? What does it mean to believe in Jesus, to hold on to him, to trust him with our lives? For Nicodemus, it meant starting anew, letting go of all he thought he understood about the life of faith. It meant being born again, becoming a newborn, vulnerable, hungry, and ready to receive reality in a brand new way. It meant coming out of the darkness and risking the light. None of this could be reduced to an altar call or a litmus test. The work of trusting Jesus was mind-bending, soul-altering work. It was hard and it took time, and it involved setbacks, fears, and disappointments. No wonder Nicodemus walked away baffled that first night. Jesus was calling him to so much more than a rote recitation of the sinner's prayer. He was calling him to fall in love and stay in love. Why is belief important to God? Because love is important to God. To believe is to be loved. Christianity, in a nutshell, sounds catchy. 
but in the end, I don't think it exists. I also don't think easy answers or efficient sound bites will serve us well during the season of Lent. After all, we're in the desert now. The wilderness, wandering, thirsting, yearning, waiting, and listening go with the territory. Yes, John 3.16 is a beautiful passage of Scripture, and we are right to recite it, memorize it, and cherish it. But the way of faith it points to is as vast and mysterious as all the workings of a human heart reaching out for God's. That's why we can trust it. Its challenge corresponds to reality. No love is rich, demanding, costly, and free as God's love for us can ever be reduced to the poor. Amen. Announcements. We had our first Lenten soup and supper this week. I heard we had about eight to ten-ish people, and I think it went pretty well. So if you are interested in signing up to bring soup or to leave, please um, check the sign-up sheets in Parish Hall. There are also community Lenten lunches, so another soup, I assume, of some sort. Um, so if you're interested in getting other people's takes on readings and stuff that's going on in Lent, uh, check those out. The next one looks like it will be, where are they? They're First Christian Church. <laughs> They're all at They're all First Christian Church, but uh, different people are providing the meals and the, so it looks like Reverend Cody Jellison. Let me go with that. That's how you pronounce their name? Is leading it. So, uh, Coffee Hour post sign up is also in Parish Hall. And. Oh, there's more? Okay, cool. Sharon's gonna go with the rest. <laughs> I, I know, I was like. They are presenting the song of music. It <laughs> <laughs> actually reminded me of everything I love. Uh, I think the first show is Thursday night. There are some times that are around town. I could not find it anywhere in the media. Um, so if you are really interested, let me you can call and I'll give you some details. So not those. Um, also, don't forget to spring forward next week. So we want to do that. And then I saw another sign, and I believe Drew had mentioned this, but uh, First Presbyterian is having organ recitals every Sunday afternoon, I believe it. Was it four? Four. Okay, so there's a lot of neat things happening during the churches and the nice and beautiful. Pub Theology is this Thursday. <coughs> Get my days right? Okay. Pub Theology is this Thursday at Pub 15 at 7 p.m. Vestry is next week. Any other announcements? Birthdays or anniversaries? Um, I saw, I did, we did get an email sent out um, and responses have been a little bit better today. Sorry I didn't mention at the beginning of the service, but we are switching to right one, so you will see different responses. So, uh, please pay attention to that poll. I think we were also going to let people know that we're saying, oh, yes. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, yes. So the, uh, the Greek, 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 so the Greek, Kyrie eleison and Christ eleison means Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual portion. 